So the thing is, technology sort of reinforces our existing tendencies in unhealthy ways by acting as a megaphone in the public space. Nearly everyone has the perfect distraction device, smartphone, in their pockets, always ready to type up an angry tweet for the world to see at any minute, at any second. Millennials are pretty much the only generation who has not become more depressed or anxious over the years because they grew up between 1981 and 1996, an era that wasn't dominated by public outrage, vast amounts of information and yeah, basically constant wars breaking out. Of course, we never really had a peaceful time in the history since humans roamed this planet, but I would say that the current world state is even worse than it has been like 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so yeah, we had occasional events which were traumatic to say the least, but uh, nowadays everything seems so fast and widespread and like one thing in the Middle East has tremendous uh, yeah, consequences in the western part of the hemisphere. So it's really like all interconnected, I, I, I feel like. And when it comes to Gen Z, they are a different story. Pretty much all of them are aware of the bad effects and consequences of social media news and generally want to limit consumption. Nevertheless, it has become compulsive, an addiction, and above all, people are afraid of missing out. If you give a three-year-old a smartphone, you will be surprised how fast he or she learns the necessary functions to use it properly. And by the way, the screen time between the genders is almost the same. However, girls are more on social and visual apps like Pinterest, Tumblr back in the day, while boys prefer YouTube and gamification aspects, so online games and stuff. And parents usually are like, oh, what's the matter? Technology is going to rule the future anyway. Why not let my kid get accustomed to it at a young age? That's one part that speaks like rationally about the world, like looking at the world, everything is moving so fast, I just mentioned. So the internet is like an integral part of our everyday lives. Why not introduce them early? At the same time, they are aware of the consequences that arise from it. It's this fear of losing their child to something, yeah, well, not, re not attached to reality. And at the same time, they don't want their kid to be like left behind. So it's a thin line. And we are incredibly social by nature and we need interaction, like real, authentic interaction. Professor and doctor of psychology, Jonathan Haidt, has started a movement that encourages parents and children to use flip phones and attend summer camps and clubs again. He sees the dangers unfolding in real time and he's studying in the field since the last 10 years. He says, since 2016, things have turned out pretty dramatically because Gen Z is the first generation to experience the full spectrum of AI, smartphones, algorithms and digitalization and like companies are spending billions to make you more addicted to the apps so it's no wonder <laughs> and when every politician or like some politicians not everyone but when even politicians check the immediate response after one of their speeches or public appearances directly on x well that's a sign of the shackles it imposes on us and also on democracy. And the most logical way to shake off these shackles is well to build sort of a fake public persona while holding completely different beliefs in the private sphere of your own home or with your friends. Everyone is dependent on this online persona and the recognition it gets from then on, linking the self-worth to likes and comments while becoming more and more agreeable uh, to the audiences and to the perceived followers. That's till the point where there's so much pressure weighing in on your shoulders that every minor slip out of the political alignment you've identified with or you've built will create an uproar of like never seen before intensity. You know, if you're always like the liberal left guy, you always have to carry that position with you because you built your followers on that premise. 
and if something is happening where in the world where you don't or you want to speak your mind but you can't really you have to like tiptoe on a minefield basically and it's not only a disaster for democracy but also harmful to our health and that's at an unprecedented rate i want to dive a little deeper into the interview now between dr k and chris williamson and explain how technology basically numbs our curiosity we are no longer alone with ourselves when you get up from your desk at work for example to attend the bathroom you look at your cell phone maybe just to avoid a potential well unpleasant situation or small talk we all know it like well especially the guys know it when you're like a club setting or a house party and some new people arrive and you pull out your phone to scroll on the weather app you know to look well how's the weather in uh, tanzania right now you know it's like <laughs> i don't know it's so funny to me and the thing is the so-called bad emotions that are produced in the limbic system of our brains they are very close anatomically to the hippocampus and that is the learning center this means that we learn effectively from bad experiences for example the shame of having received bad feedback which leads to you trying harder the next time ideally if we turn off these bad emotions we lose the motivation to change something and then we look at the past with depressive patterns and at the future with anxious patterns without trying to sort out our thoughts in the present for example if you plan to complete your weekly exercise and you put it off today or postpone it until the evening like multiple times throughout the day you will actually need the willpower that was originally required just to start exercising and it will instead be used to fight the pent-up anxiety because you didn't start sooner as you had promised yourself so because now you're judging yourself for it it became even harder to start exercising now in these sort of emotional states and we are emotionally by nature um, the sensations you attend to on your daily surroundings they can be categorized very quickly but unfortunately also pretty inaccurately and when we are overwhelmed with decisions and in the general direction of our life um, well we look outside and turn to society and the world for advice you look at what other people recommend and do in their lives and we all know no one has pretty much any idea what they're doing they're just working off their current best guess so even our parents <laughs> you sort of have to be like understand understanding because they are also living this life the first time they're trying to handle it they're trying to raise you they have no clue what they're doing they're just like looking reading trying stuff out and then going on from there you know small steps and we also know that like comparison is a thief of joy so yeah this leads to all kinds of problems starting with feeling paralyzed because of the sheer amount of options available to you and instead we have to sort of turn inward to discover what we actually need and what women are generally more in touch with their feelings due to biological factors for example that could be increased estrogen or oxytocin levels it has proven helpful for men to approach things more rationally especially in the past if you ask them how they feel it's always associated with anger you know if you ask your mate well how are you doing mate and he's like oh i'm pissed off or i just fucked up something or i'm frustrated or agitated you know um, it's always connected to this sort of inner turmoil i would say sometimes of course you can just like i'm good you know and that's it <laughs> but usually there's more behind it and there are usually also more or many small emotions intertwined in this one um, pissed off you know and so it's hard for them to lay that open and to even discover it because we're never taught to do so basically this general categorization of emotions is also increasingly the case with women as the data shows there was one study that tested what ways work best for men to look inward and one was apparently especially effective as it turns out they are good at describing what they feel physically 
like heartbeats or knots in their stomach, a frog in their throat, shaky legs. And also the breathing rhythm alone is so deeply anchored in us that we know how a person feels depending on the frequency and length of their breath. You know, if I'm like breathing like this, you can pretty much guess that I'm nervous. And if it's like a calmer tone, like, you know, it's like slower. It also calms down your whole nervous system. So you immediately can guess like, okay, what kind of state the person opposite to you may be in. Consciously perceiving this and slowing it down triggers many mechanisms inside of us, which is why it's used to start meditation as well. Or in like when you want to concentrate. It's like taught at the military, you know, control your breathing, assess the situation calmly and not in like the emotional state. And in this study, after assessing the physical sensations, the men should ask themselves, okay, when these symptoms occur in another person, what does that actually indicate? And then you quickly realize that you yourself are feeling this whole series of feelings as well based on what you analyzed on the person that is supposed to be opposite of you. You know you basically transfer the situation onto yourself and then you are like, ah, okay, so a lump in my throat is basically, well, mm, I'm sort of nervous to talk out, which may be rooted in my prior, I don't know, public appearance I gave, you know, could be stuff like that. And the thing is, and this is one is important, Whatever you want to encourage, let it flourish within you. Freud already started or stated uh, that language is an outlet for actions. If someone talks about killing someone with murderous intent and thoughts, the likelihood of them actually doing it decreases when, as mentioned, they talk with a psychiatrist, for example, or their friends or something. If you have something positive that drives you and you communicate it to others, this drive is reduced. So basically the opposite happens. Or like, not the opposite, but um, what would be beneficial to you uh, is reduced in this scenario. When we talk about overthinking or like hyper-awareness, it's a pretty much neutral state. You have to work on your focus because thinking is generally a good thing, <laughs> you know? Otherwise, awareness is like directed everywhere. It's like beams coming out of your visual cortex and there's no clear focus. And you want to basically have a laser sharp focus on something that matters to you most, that you prioritize. And if it's like spread out, well, of course, there's an overload of stimuli and information if it's directed everywhere. And the, a good exercise to focus on like something strictly is basically some practice of um, Eastern culture. So in Hinduism and Buddhism, there is this uh, term for it. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember it, to be honest. But it's basically, it consists of a guided, a guided sort of meditation. Not like in a classical sense where you sit down and just focus on your breathing, for example, but it's centering or directing your focus at a candle flame, for example. And you do that as long as you can keep your eyes open. So if you have to blink, you should try to still focus. But if it gets like, if it hurts, then you should blink, of course. And also this, I'm just saying, this should be do, done with a guided teacher who has experience with this. And uh, the other thing is also a practice of the Eastern culture. You just sit still <laughs> and then you quickly notice that you will feel uncomfortable because no matter how comfortable a seat may be, if you simply sit still without doing anything, well, sooner or later your body wants to move. And so the only thing that gives you comfort is your breath because that's the only thing you can control and that is actively like happening right now in that moment when you're just sitting still. And so that's a great way to train your breathing pattern and to also get into like a mindful state. The thing with the candle is that 
you sort of train your endurance and you also you fight um, well boredom basically so if you're not doing anything of course you will feel bored people are even like hurting themselves to avoid feeling bored so there were also experiments with that and once you are trained with looking at that candle you can also start closing your eyes and you will see the image in like negative um, colors when you have closed eyes because it's not completely or merely dark it's like there is this this visual thing that burned literally burned into your eyesight that can still be visible when clo with closed eyes so you should then focus on the candle in the darkness and you can like the picture can be there for 10 to 15 minutes so it's like a really meditative state as well that you can enter and something you would not usually do at that in intense uh, or intensity the thing is we need to make it easier to appreciate and focus on the simple everyday things our thoughts are deceptive and so often obscure memories or give us false impulses especially for men talk therapy has been found to be less effective than problem solving direct therapy however you should still pay attention to your fleeting thoughts and why they occur several times throughout the day and then you should think or talk about it or write something down so there's nothing wrong with like talk therapy but for men it can also be just helpful to say hey i need to go to the gym three times a week i need to work on some project i need to talk to my friends these kind of things talking about emotions and trauma is good but men also need something to pursue and something to act upon most men go to therapy for like experiencing breakup or emotional trauma or it's almost always related to some love thing after all the likelihood of suicide is four times higher after a breakup in men and it's important to talk but also to bring in that closure in like some way that actually demands you achieving something like in the physical world you know and therapy usually is more effective on women because it's like the talkative phase and the talking about emotions and stuff i'm not saying that it's not good for men to do that as well i just stated that it's really beneficial but there's also this mechanism of hey i need to get to work and i need to uh, distract myself from the constant thought cycles that are happening you should of course confront them and note them and perceive them but then again there is this aspect of active doing okay <laughs> i just um, repeated that a lot of times but it's important okay and this one breakup that you may talk to your therapist about they can make you biased towards relationships and women and you suddenly lump everyone together in one basket maybe you join the red pill movement and look at everything through this lens instead of acting and thinking holistically you know like taking some advice from this group and this group and this group and then forming your own opinion your bias and thinking then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and you only get together with such women whereas relationships consist of so much more if you realize <clears throat> that precise introspection is so valuable and meditation is a leading practice in that it just makes sense to to stop doing it it can be like the most helpful thing ever because as i mentioned with the self-fulfilling prophecy let's assume you you think okay i need to hit the gym now and be an aggressive male high testosterone follow the andrew tate guide whatever it may be you know then your relationships sort of become transactional you only date women who give you something back and there should of course be like a, a healthy exchange of giving and taking but if everything becomes transactional i do this and i'm going to be rewarded with sex or something in the evening then you are only going to attract women that are also down for this because the other ones just leave <laughs> basically and so you're always stuck in that cycle and it's reaffirming your beliefs on what a relationship should be or look like based on that one thing that you 
like integrated into your thinking just because of that recent breakup you you know you are like oh, all women are the same but you can say that and you should still like figure out okay how can relationships look like and what should they look like and it's never simple <laughs> i can guarantee you um if you realize when you get into meditation that you are are merely an overload of thoughts and that thoughts do not identify you we can detach ourselves from the apparent importance of these thoughts the void of seeking validation through achievement is an endless chase when self-worth is anchored in external successes there will always be another goalpost no matter the perfect to-do list that you cross off every task of you will set new tasks and new goals with the same energy as you did prior so it doesn't it doesn't make sense to connect your worth on the achievements of your career or something you know all individuals can really control only one thing and that's their actions in the moment in the present our efforts our reactions to situations and our attitudes The idea that achievements define self-worth is wrong, as everything is determined pretty much anyway, and luck plays an immense role. Successful people often neglect that luck was a crucial factor in their success, because then they would like diminish their achievement, you know, like, I did this, it's because I struggled, you know, and describing something to luck, well, <laughs> then everyone could have done it, you know, it could be like, picked a random person and yeah then he or she is the one who is supposed to do it or to to achieve the success but as for example robert sapolsky neuroendocrinologist and sam harris they are pretty much um, under the impression that everything is determined we have no free will and the daily things you do accumulate and then lead to a certain outcome <coughs> excuse me so one thing to take away here we should focus on the actions we take and not on the results they produce and when you get into predicaments or depressive situations you tend to downplay even the small wins in the day and attribute them attribute them to factors beyond your control and that is the start of an endless downward spiral dr k called it taking the poison <laughs> because then it's like okay i'm in this depressive state and then you suddenly achieve something and then it's like self-pity again oh man i managed to get out of the bed or after out of the house after three days wow great job me thank you and you have to realize that every win no matter how small is good as long as you're like moving in the right direction not standing still It's progress no matter how slow it is or how slow it may seem or how insignificant it may seem it's still progress so every win is good it's a comparison with others or our past that can devalue these wins and so your ego is not you it should not be given too much attention as it's too easily offended and it consists of being seen by others okay your ego is pretty much neglectable and we should definitely disconnect ourselves from the ego the body you inhabit and the thoughts they will come you know and it's on you to perceive them and then to sort them out you know based on multiple factors but your attitude is everything that matters in that moment okay thank you so much for listening to this i hope you enjoyed ask me any questions if you have any below and i'll see you on the next one goodbye